Welcome into First Draft, where rather than running a 40-yard dash, we give you 40-plus minutes of everything that you need to know about the 2024 NFL Draft. I am Field Yates, and of course, joining me, as he always does, is Mel Kuyper Jr., another combine in the books. Mel, what would you think about the week that was in Indianapolis? Now, you feel you want to validate what you saw on tape. I think that's the whole key to this equation is don't overreact, good or bad, to a workout. Sometimes, hey, you like a guy and he doesn't test well, what's going to happen at the pro day? Will that make up for that? Or will a number that you saw in the workout override a bad number, okay? Like a vertical jump, explosiveness, override a 40 time, okay? So you got to be really careful with the interviews, medical, very important as well in terms of the combine. So I think validation is what you're looking for. Overreaction is what you want to guard against. That's a very, very fine line that we are constantly towing there as it pertains to the stuff that really matters versus the stuff that might not. Mel, we're going to get into winners and perhaps standouts for the wrong reasons as well later on in the show, but uh, this is an interesting and different combine. Spending time in Indianapolis this past week, things did feel differently. Players like Marvin Harrison Jr. showed up got measured, I believe did some interviews, and then departed from the combine. No on-field work for him. Jaden Daniels and Malik Neighbors from LSU opted to not weigh in at all. Caleb Williams from USC did not take part in the throwing session, which is becoming more and more common for quarterbacks at the top. How do you think, though, this event has changed, and what do you think it all means? Is there an impact as far as what the scouting process now looks like in the modern edition of the NFL Combine? You know, I can say it's a sign of the times. Everything's changing. Look yeah. at college football. These kids are professionals before they become a professional in the NFL. They're getting paid. They're on the commercials. They're seeing them all over the TV. Uh, it's just a different way of doing things. And these kids now are operating differently now. They're saying, hey, I'm a professional already. I'm not going to have you dictate policy to me. I'm going to dictate policy to you. I'm going to do it the way I see fit. I'm not going to just go this traditional way anymore. I'm going against that. Remember, they have their agents. They have their family. They have a lot of people. They've seen how it's affected players over the years. And, uh, again, you can look at it and say take a negative twist to it, or you can just take to say this is the way it's going to be moving forward. It's like when kids started to opt out of bowl games. Did you yeah. hold it against them? Did you hold it against kids the COVID year that opted not to play? You, know, you can't, like I say, overreact because it is, as I say, a sign of the times. Yeah, Mel, I wanted to offer like a little bit of perspective and talking to people over the past few days and getting their various thoughts on the fact that the event is different. I mean, the idea of a player not even showing up or not taking part in the weigh-ins is something that I think 10 years ago would have been sort of unfathomable in the eyes of scouts. But from the player's perspective, Mel, as you noted, like, first of all, it's their choice, right? They have no obligation to attend the combine. No rule says that if you don't go to the combine, you can't get drafted. It is a voluntary event that if they choose to participate in, they can. But moreover, if you're a Marvin Harrison Jr. or a Jaden Daniels or a Caleb Williams or a Drake May or Malik Neighbors, whoever it might be, you're probably saying to NFL teams, if you don't know who I am based off what I put on tape last year or the years prior to that, then you need to work on your evaluating skills. What more can I show you if I'm Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. running a 40? If you don't think I'm fast, then you haven't watched me. As for the quarterbacks, we think right now, and I guess things could change, but we feel pretty darn good about the idea that those three quarterbacks are going to go one, two, three, in some order to some teams. So maybe there isn't that much more they have to prove. That's the player side of it, and I respect it. As you said, it's a sign of the times. The scouting side of it that I've heard from people around the NFL, Mel, is that the scouting combine is a very finite period of time for these players. They're there for three, four days in total, and it's not like they're asking these players to go and dig ditches for three days in Indianapolis. It's just a useful data point, and it's an opportunity for these players to kind of showcase themselves to the league. So I get both sides of it. There are people that are disgruntled in the scouting community right now, Mel, but I also think that would you be surprised, let me ask this, would you be surprised if five years from now, players are infrequently taking part in the on-field work? Because I think we could be heading to where this event is essentially the medicals and the interviews. I'm with you, Field. I was talking to kids years ago because they would call and say, hey, what should I do? I said, if you don't have 
confidence in your 40 time, that you're going to run an elite time and you're a speed guy, then wait till your pro day. If you can't nail it at your pro day feel, you're not poked and prodded, you're getting up at different times, you're in a different place, here you have your home turf, right? It's a home game for you. If you can't, if you can't nail it there, you're not going to nail it at the combine. He'll say, well, everybody's there and everybody's not at pro days. Who cares? They all get the numbers. That's what we always want to say. Oh, everybody's at the combine. That's why you have to do it in front of everybody. No, you don't. No, you don't. They're all going to have that information. And they're gonna, people are like, well, I'm not going to draft guys that wouldn't work at the combine. Somebody once said, well, guess what? Their first round pick that year was a guy who didn't work at the combine. So you, you can talk tough. But by the time we get to late April in the draft, a lot of this stuff goes by the boards. In terms of guys like Orlando Brown, I heard him tweet during the uh, saw him tweet during the combine saying it's about mental, not necessarily physical workout, right? He became a third-round pick, offensive tackle, heck of a pick. Cooper Cup was a third-round pick. Puka Nakua last year, fifth round, right? You think about, you know, Joe Hayden, didn't hurt him. Pro Day came up, whatever. Remember uh, uh, Terrell Suggs? Even his individual workout didn't have a great time, yet he still went top 10. Ozzie Newsom drafted him here with the Baltimore Ravens. So Alvin Kamara, third round, but he had the great vertical, not the great 40. So it, it really is just a part of the process. When you overrate it field and you put all the eggs in that one basket, it's not good. Good. So you got to. That's that's the, that's why it's not an exact science field. It, it's trying to figure this all out, not overreact. Keon Coleman, if he didn't run, would it be raving about Keon Coleman right now if he didn't run at forty? So he's got to be a mid first round. Look at the gauntlet. Look at the way he, he played. If he would have waited until the pro day to run a forty, his stock would not have been maybe dropping into the second round. Mel, it's why we'll come back to this thing that I think is fundamental and important to remind people over the next eight or so weeks. I think seven and a half weeks to be specific. The tape often doesn't lie, Mel. It's usually the best resource for a reason. Obviously, the medical component of the combine, I would just, I would sort of contend, is incredibly important. And those interviews are so important for the football character. But some of these drills taking place in shorts and a t-shirt might be less impactful than we make them feel like during the week in Indianapolis. All right, so coming up on the show today. Mel and I are going to dive into all the players that caught our eye. Because while sometimes this event can be perhaps a touch overblown, there were still some very impressive things and maybe some things that caught our attention for the wrong reasons as well. So what we're going to try to do is name some players that came to mind and some themes that came to mind for the weekend, but also try to put some important context behind them because I think a little bit of context goes a long way in the world of the 2024 NFL Combine. All right, so coming up here on First Draft, Mel and I are going to dive into this very stacked wide receiver class and debate how exactly you find a way to separate players at the top. That's coming up next here on First Draft. All right, we're back here on First Draft. Mel Kuyper Jr., I am Field Yates. And Mel, uh, you and I both know, we've talked about it for months now, how great this wide receiver class is. This past week in Indianapolis only reinforced that. I want to ask you a very simple question. After those one, two, three receivers and maybe even including those one, two, three wide receivers, how exactly do you sort through and stack this wide receiver class when you have so many capable players that all feel like they could become legit NFL starters? That's going to be a tricky part, Feels lining those guys up and figuring it out. Pro day is still to come. Information is still to be gathered. And we're looking at players every day. And when you get players in a group, four or five guys in a group that are all bunched together, the numbers will separate those guys, Field. So that is important. Ricky Pearsall is a name I think you have to put up there pretty high. Arizona State, Herm Edwards raves about him. Every time I talk to Herm, Herm, what about my boy Ricky? Ricky Pearsall yeah. was Arizona State with me. I remember a lot of great players were at Arizona State with Herm before they moved on somewhere else later in their careers, right? Ricky Pearsall being one of them going to Florida. Is he now a second-round pick? I thought during the year he'd be maybe a third or fourth-round pick. So Ricky Pearsall's name is going to be heavily in that mix. But what do you do with a Troy Franklin? You had talked about him being spindly field. Do we move him down? What do we do with Keon Coleman running a 4-6-2, 4-6-4, but great in a gauntlet, right? We look like look like a mid-first rounder during the year in a lot of games. Do you push him into the second round? I had NFL people saying, well, if he ran in the 4-5 range, he's a first rounder guaranteed, maybe even a mid-first rounder if he runs 4-4-6. He ran 4-6. Six and change, does that move him into the second? They thought going in, if he did, that could move him into the second round. So again, worry, don't, don't guard against overreaction, but use it as a way to separate. And I think right now, Phil, and I'd like to have your number based on your ratings as we speak in real time, I have 26 wide receivers within the first four rounds. How many do you have right now? 
Okay, so I've done the, uh, my top 50 mail, or at least it is almost done. It's coming out here on Wednesday on ESPN.com. And I believe the number of receivers that I had in the top 50 alone was 11? Might have been 9. Some of me, 9 mm -hmm. to 11 in the top 50. So the first four rounds is about 130 picks when you factor in compensatory picks as well, Mel. So my number probably is going to approach around 25 because – Here's the debate that I also wrestled with when I was making my top 50 and looking at some of those finals few spots. When I'm debating, is it better for a team to invest in wide receiver 9 or 10 or 11 off the board when you could get the third or fourth best guard off the board or maybe the best or second best off-ball linebacker, probably the second best off-ball linebacker off the board in that similar range because those positions are going to drop off so dramatically after the first few players. It is a little bit of like a supply and demand negotiation, but you're absolutely right. It is a, it's just a stacked wide receiver class. So I thought about at the top, Mel, and I think that I've been doing this long enough to now to realize that people love who's won, who's two, who's three, who's four, who's five. They love that, right? They want a sequential order from 1 until 26 in the first four rounds. But what I'm realizing, Mel, is that we've got three at the very top that I think it's like choosing between your favorite pizza joint, right? I think Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze, kind of in a class unto themselves. And then I think you just get through like mini tiers beyond that, right, Mel? So like when you're stacking up this wide receiver board, I really don't think that the gap between Brian Thomas Jr., and Adonai Mitchell is anything other, Mel, than how does one team see the personality or the football character versus how another team sees it? Or maybe one team has a longtime scout who's been scouting the Texas area who pounds the table and says, we need Adon Adonai Mitchell, and he has a stronger opinion than he does of Brian Thomas Jr. So it feels to me, this wide receiver class, as we're sorting through it, Mel, so much of it is just what does your offense need? Not so much... This guy is definitively, unquestionably better than this other player. No question about it, Field. And I think the separation of a group. So if you feel like Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, Brian Thomas Jr., Keon Coleman are all bunched together, what do you do there? And do you look at the numbers and say, okay, now I have to bump up Brian Thomas Jr.? A bump down Keon Coleman just a bit. Now, he'll have his pro day. We'll see what he runs there. Xavier Worthy with that record 4-2-1. Like them coming in. Thought he could go late first round. Do you move? How far up do you move him? Adonai Mitchell. Big fast, right? Georgia, Texas. Did it all. They got the ball to him. Maybe they, they end up uh, moving on. You think about the, you know, you go back to games where you say, yeah, you, you know, when you have receivers like that, give them the ball a little more. Bottom line is, I think when you look at Brian Thomas Jr., yeah, that's the length. 4-3-3 speed, the ability this year to take a top off a of defense, average 17 yards a catch, 17 touchdowns. He was the other receiver at LSU for Jane Daniels opposite Malik Neighbors. You watch him here, smooth, deceptive. Yeah, he just his hand, hey, I'm open. If you're even, you're leaving, right? He was leaving, and this kid had a heck of a season, and there's room to get better. So he has not yet become the receiver Brian Thomas Jr. may be once he gains more coaching and experience. For me, this is a kid, once you run that 40 and you're as big and as long as he is and as athletic as he is, and you had the production with Jane Daniels and Malik Neighbors, and he did. Keep in mind, this defense couldn't stop anybody. Those receivers had to do their job as well. You see the bump up in production. Is he a one-year wonder? Yeah, but he has the talent, and he did it this year at the highest level, okay, and the fact that he's still not yet the player he could become. You always like that. And I think for me right now, you could make a strong case. I didn't in the Mach 1.0 going mid first, bumped down to the late first when you talk to people. Now I've got to bump him back into the mid first yeah. and, and Mach 3.0 field. So he's the kind of guy really helped his, his cause. I think you got to look at somebody's going to get lost in the shuffle. Khalil Shakir did yeah. a couple years ago, went with 2022. Bo Melton did. He went in the seventh round. He's with Green Bay now. Somebody's going to get lost in the shuffle when you have so many receivers being evaluated, as I do, 26 in the first four rounds. Somebody's going to drop in the fifth, sixth, seventh round. Turns out to be really good. Maybe three or four guys drop into day three that turn out to be more than just good in the National Football League. I get the sense, Mel, when we're talking day three, the morning of that day three of the draft, we're going to be talking about all the great receivers who are still available on the board. Not because teams have overlooked them, but because there's just so many others that have already gone in front of them. This wide receiver class is just so astronomically deep.
You mentioned Brian Thomas Jr. You also alluded earlier to Ricky Pearsall. Just wanted to quickly uh, sort of close the book on Ricky Pearsall and what you specifically liked the most out of the workout from this weekend. He just goes gets the football field. You know, he's 6'1". Uh, he attacks the ball. He's got versatility to line up in a variety of different places. He's got ability after the catch. He plays the game of football like he enjoys contact. That he likes being physical and aggressive and tough. Hits don't bother him. Uh, he is a guy feisty, comes to play. Did it at Arizona State. Did it at Florida. There's a lot to like about Pearsall when you see how he tests. You see how you compare him to other receivers that we thought were maybe second or third rounders, and he's right there or better. I got to believe second round field, somebody's got him. We talked about Cooper Cup went in the third round. Puka Nakua went in the fifth round. I thought third or fourth round at times during the year. I got to believe second round for him. You talk about what he had done during the course of his career, consistently at two different schools getting it done, then test the way he did. I'll give you another kid that I wanted to throw out there as a day three guy Let's go. who could be one of those is Bub Means from yeah. Pitt. Bub Means is a good football player. Bub Means did it at ten He was a cornerback at Tennessee. Yep. Okay. Then he goes to Louisiana Tech. He develops there. Average, what, 19 plus a catch. He's returning kicks. Then he goes and goes to Pitt. He plays with all these different coordinators, different systems, four different quarterbacks at Pitt this past year. Put up really good number. Watch him beat Jarvis Brownlee at Louisville yeah. in a game. I mean, he was taking the top off of defense. Had a 75-yard touchdown catch against Virginia Tech. He's 6'1", 212, runs good. He's got big hands and long arms, Field. Bub Means in the fourth round, you think, Field? When we're talking day three, yeah. if he's on that list and on that board, I like that kid. The other thing I'll remind people about the combine and what it reveals is traits, and people are going to end up drafting traits. The skills and the production and the, the stats uh, are one part of the equation here, Mel, but at some point you're making a bet on what this guy can become. Along those lines, the trait, perhaps, that was the story of the weekend was speed at wide receivers. Let's talk about, for a moment, Xavier Worthy from Texas, wide receiver. How, how much stock do you put into a 4 2 one, 40 quickly before we pivot to his teammate, Adonai Mitchell, who I think is kind of right there neck and neck with also Brian Thomas Jr.? I'll say this about Xavier Worthy. He had the hand injury, remember, the broken hand two yep. years ago, and he had some drops, but he played through that. And he took some criticism, but he had the injury. And Sark even said, hey, don't forget he was hurt. Yeah. And, uh, and he played through it. And he never complained. And he goes out there this year and he improves in that area. He's a guy, he's space guy. He can be the guy down the field making plays. You saw the speed. You saw the big playability. You saw how dangerous he was after the catch. You saw he could just leave guys in his wake, okay? Xavier Worthy was an in the first round mix before he ran 4 2 1. We thought he'd run the 4 3s. He ran 4 2 1, which was amazing. And he's still running. This yeah. kid is still running. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of the day, field, he doesn't, it's, it's not like he's getting this huge, he's not Darius Hayward Bay, right. you know, who's going to jump into the top 10. Maybe he could. Maybe he could. But yeah. you know, we saw Darius Hayward Bay jump in the top 10, be more straight line. This guy's more than that field. I think he deserves to be in that discussion, in that. I'd say 15 to 25 range. I thought maybe 25 to 32. Maybe you bump him up into the mid to late first round instead of saying he's a late one, early to mid two. Yeah, I can see that. I can still see the late one, early to mid two, Mel, because I knew he was fast going into the combine, right? It's the size, 165 yeah. pounds, that I think is going to be the hardest thing for me to overcome just because that body armor alone, it's going to invite teams trying to press him. Now, you can't press what you can't hit, right? You can't catch up to Xavier Worthy, but uh, size will be what determines, I think, sort of the ceiling for him. Let's go to Keon Coleman, and we'll come back to Adonai Mitchell if time permits. But Keon Coleman, Mel, you and I love Keon Coleman. We've been talking about this a lot on this show. I pounded the table for him in Indianapolis on Thursday before he ran. And then he ran a 4 6 one Mel. This one's going to drive me bonkers until we get to the draft itself. How much talk do you put into the 46140 that Keon Coleman ran? Or, as you mentioned earlier, the fact that over the past two years of next gen stats tracking mile per hour speed during the gauntlet drill for wide receivers, he's the fastest wideout over the past two years. What matters more to you? I like the fact that he did well. I, I'm not the 45. Puka Nakua ran 4.57, 4, 4.58, 4, whatever it was. Cooper Cup was 4.62, whatever it was there. Look at him here in contested situations. Look at that hand eye coordination, right? Look at the way he goes and gets the football as a power forward in basketball would do, okay? Getting that rebound. 
Talk about the fluidity of Keon Coleman. I, I thought he was quiet in games, so they didn't look at him enough. Johnny Wilson, remember, was on the other side. They had Trey Benson, who, by the way, ran a 4 3 9 40 at the combine, mm -hmm. running the football. So there was other options as well. But Keon Coleman, to me, if he gets into the second round field, I got to jump at the opportunity to get there, which I said earlier, would you rather have Keon Coleman in the second round or Brian Thomas Jr., Worthy, mid, and in the middle of the first, late first? Keon Coleman's a good football player. And I think it, it, we look at Cup. We look at, at Nakua. Why are they successful? Because there was something you could hang your hat on. Look at how he ran the gauntlet. Yeah. I mean, just look at it. Watch him. Watch other guys all over the place, okay? Keon Coleman is a productive, smooth, athletically gifted receiver who will play at a high level in the NFL. Yeah, I just want to say this quickly about Keon Coleman is as you and I are doing our exercises like our top 25 players overall or our top 50 players overall or our mock drafts, we are constantly figuring out how do we view these players versus how the league might wind up drafting these players. It pained me to do it, but I had to drop Keon Coleman in my top 50 player overall board mail because the NFL has shown us like the idea of drafting a 4-6-1 wide receiver in the first round is borderline unfathomable in today's NFL, right? So along those lines, if history suggests that 461 probably won't put you in the top 32 picks, does that mean that the highest you could rank Keon Coleman is 33 on the overall big board? Logically, the answer is probably yes, Mel. So he's going to wind up being lower on my big board than I would like. But as we close the book on Keon Coleman, I still have a lot of love for him. And I think you feel the exact same way. I do, and I know we're going to get to Adonai Mitchell. I know Adonai Mitchell Field, you have strong opinion on the wide receiver from Texas, formerly of Georgia. So he, I think, bumps up into that group, into that first round, and solidifies that where Keon Coleman becomes a bargain, a steal somewhere in the second round. Yeah, and I, the last thing I'll say on Keon Coleman is I've been talking to people in the scouting community. I've been asking them, when we have these players, and Puka Naku is the most recent and best example, who slide through the cracks and then become stars, what's the common thread? The common thread that a couple people have offered up is those guys have elite football character. They've got the alpha mentality. Keon Coleman does have that alpha mentality. So I'm still going to bet on Keon Coleman becoming a heck of a player at the NFL level. All right, we got plenty more ahead here on first draft, which includes more thoughts on the wide receiver class and also the offensive tackle classes. Mel Kuyper Jr. and Field Yates return with more first draft in just a moment. All right, we're back here on First Draft. He's Mel Kuyper Jr. I am Field Yates. The 2024 NFL Combine is in the books now, Mel, and everybody's talking about the wide receiver class as we just did. But let me ask you, what's more stacked, the wide receiver class or the offensive tackle class? In terms of overall depth, this wide receiver, in terms of the first round field, it's going to be a lot of offensive tackles coming yeah. off the board. And I'll tell you what, there's a couple guys that are going to be tough evaluations. Amarius Mims at Georgia. You wish you would have been healthy. You wish you would have been there doing what Broderick Jones did, right? But I'll tell you what, as a right tackle who's got talent, and you watch him, how smooth he is operating in terms of the combine. You look at Amarius Mims. You wish he would have had that one full season. I think he could have gone in the top 15, top 17 overall had he had that. Now you're talking about down there in that Green Bay, Dallas area. Can he be a left tackle in the NFL? Is he just a right tackle? What is Amarius Mess? I know he's got a ton of talent, and I know he's going to be coached up in the NFL to become a much better player than we saw in Georgia where he's just touching the surface of the kind of player he can become. And there's another kid as well that you think about Roger Rosengarten field is a kid I thought should have gone back to Washington for another year. He didn't, but since he decided to come out, he's done everything well. Roger Rosengarten played for Ed McCaffrey in high school. Yeah, he, he was a heck of a basketball player as well as a football player field. This is a kid had two years, got 28 starts at right tackle. Tested great field. Is Roger Roger, I had people saying Roger Rosengarten is a solid second rounder at worst an early three. Forget three. He's a two who would have been a one had he gone back and had a full year like we talked about with Mims. Roger Rosengarten's that right tackle. Maybe the Jets can find a way to get a second round pick. They don't have one right now and they don't take the tackle in the first round. Somebody's going to get a good right tackle in Roger Rosengarten in round two field. Yeah, Mel, not to spoil it, but I am still sort of debating the final few spots in that top 50. And on the short list for one of those final few spots in the top 50 is Roger Rosengarten from University of Washington. Had an excellent 40 time, the fastest amongst all players there on the offensive line. Uh, let's go back to the top five offensive tackles right now, Mel. And I'll start here. I believe there is a tier by himself of one man, that's Joe Alt. And then I think we get into debate time. 
Do you agree that Joe Alt, who, by the way, in Indianapolis was six foot eight and five eighths of an inch, nearly six foot nine, Mel, and 321 pounds. Do you believe that Joe Alt believes or should be the unquestioned offensive tackle one in your eyes, even if he's not the first tackle off the board? Do you think he's the best tackle in the draft? You know, it's debatable right now. It really is. I think he will be certainly right there. I think, and I keep bringing up the name, and it's not, it's somebody that forced you to go back there and look at J.C. Latham. I bring up J.C. Latham at Alabama because he is the consummate right tackle. We all mm. get locked into, well, can they be a left tackle? J.C. Latham says, I, hey, I can be a left tackle. I don't want to get pigeonholed into being a right tackle only. I have the skill set to become a left tackle. We were talking about, well, if you're a Chargers, move Joe Walt to right tackle, okay? Latham's already that. Mm. He played at Alabama at a high level. I, I went with him in the mock. And that's where you have to separate ratings from mock. I'm going to move Latham up just because of the fact that, okay, if he has that skill set, and we'll find pro days coming up. But Latham played at a very high level at right tackle. He had that hiccup against Washington uh, against uh, in that game against, uh, was it, uh, uh, the Michigan game, Michigan game when, yeah. uh, in the semifinal game. You're talking about a guy who did really well for the whole game. He had the hiccup late, right? So we kind of remember that, but we don't remember. It's like J.J. McCarthy had hiccups with some interceptions. Don't remember how solid a quarterback he was for the most part. Can't just focus on them. Even Rosengarten, the, the, the national you know, title game. you got to sure throw did. those games out. Everybody has it. Pitchers have off games and a lot of their best stuff. So, again, he had the hiccup. But J.C. Latham is the one guy, when you talk about, I really believe Fieldy goes top 10. Joe Alt's going to go top 10. I think Olu from Penn State's going to drop just a bit, right? Yeah. So, again, who is the number one consensus tackle? I'm with you, but I'll say this. Troy Fatanu is a guy, if you think he can play tackle, great. If he's going to be a guard, feel, I'll let you go. Wax poetic. Do your thing. Troy Fatano, you can make an argument, is the best overall offensive lineman in this draft. What was the big question for Troy Fatano coming into the combine? By the way, we have the official pronunciation guide that is rolling through now. I saw so I'm going that. To try to you be, did a good job. Yep, Troy Fatano. So I'm going to try to be better and better about the names. Uh -huh. I sincerely apologize uh -huh. uh, to these players because they certainly deserve to have their name pronounced correctly. But the big question mark, about Fatu Tanu coming into the combine. Was, are his arms long enough? Does he have enough of a wingspan to be a <laughs> professional left tackle? Well, he had 34 and a half inch arms over an 81 inch wingspan. And uh, I'll just type, I'll put it this way. Both good enough, right? Like if it's 33 or 33 and a half inch arms, maybe it's a different conversation. But that inch can make a difference here, Mel. His length, his wingspan, and as you and I both know, the feet are just ridiculous. Ridiculous. Maybe, maybe Tyler Guyton gets there for having the best feet in this entire offensive tackle class one day. But right now, for playing a football game tomorrow, and by the way, I want guys that can help me win right away. Fautanu has the best feet of any offensive lineman in this entire class, and I think solidified the possibility of him being a left tackle and maybe the second offensive tackle off the board, man. Which brings me to this idea that I think Joe Waltz by himself in the tier. That's how I feel. Maybe the league won't reflect that, and there's really good debates beyond that. But I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to spend countless hours over the next 50 or so days debating who's two, who's three, who's four, who's five, who's six. Because there's a possibility, Mel, that Amarius Mims is like a top 15 pick. There's also a possibility that he's the seventh tackle off the board, right? Because teams are scared off by the fact he's got 803 career college snaps. Uh, I, I hate to say this, but like the injury over the weekend for Amarius Mims was kind of emblematic of the Amarius Mims experience, right? He looks great when he's out there and then he gets banged up. How reliable is this player at the NFL level? So it feels like, Mel, when we're figuring out these top five offensive tackles, go back to what I said with the wide receivers. And we'll talk about this again with the cornerbacks. It's just kind of a matter of what you want. Do you feel like that's the case in most years, Mel? Because I feel like this is a little bit different than many years where it feels like there is kind of a clear hierarchy amongst offensive tackles. Yeah, mixed opinion all over the place on these guys. But I'm with you. Jordan Morgan's another kid at Arizona, left tackle. I like the way he played. You can go to some games where, yeah, there was a hiccup or two, but he's going to get better. Remember, he's now going to be two years removed from that injury. So Jordan Morgan's another guy can't get lost in that shuffle. If you want to coach up a Patrick Paul with all that length and all that talent, you could maybe get him in the second round. But I think when you look at where we are right now, I really do believe J.C. Latham is going to be the guy, you say cleanest through the process. I think when we get to late April, he may end up being the first tackle off the board. I really believe that. Yeah. Then you get to Joe Walt. Fautanu, I'll try to get it right, Field. If I'm, Nailed Fa it. 
heck of a player. The punch, the fact that he's got longer arms, I believe, Field, correct me if I'm wrong, he has longer arms than Joe All. Uh, it's very right? – yeah, I believe that's correct. He definitely has longer arms by, like, over an inch than Talisi Puaga, by the way, who's a guy yeah. who looks bigger. Yeah. He had 33 and an eighth-inch arms, which is not going to totally impact his draft stock, but it was a data point at the very least. Yeah, I can check it real quick. I believe I saw where he did have slightly longer arms than Joe Alt. So, you're right, Fuaga is going to be in that mix. It's going to be interesting with the Jets at 10. You know, is there an offensive tackle there that they like to say, that's the 10th pick overall, that's our guy for Aaron Rodgers? Is it Latham dropping to 10 off the mock where I had him going five? What do the Chargers do? Is Alt there? Okay, is Alt there at 10? Maybe not. Is it a Fuaga? Who is it? Like you say, it's going to be really interesting what direction they go, but I think it's going to be a lot of mixed opinion. It's going to be a lot of fun to see how this shakes down by the time we get to late April in the first round. Mel, confirmed. Joe Alt, 34-inch arms. Troy Fautano, 34-and-a-half-inch arms. Alt, wingspan, 82 inches, so less than an inch longer than Fautano's, despite the fact that he's like four actual inches taller. So it is a great Great offensive tackle class, Mel, but it really is a matter of just sort of finding who you want, what you prefer most. Last guy, we have about a minute and a half before we move on. Olu Fashanu, you mentioned him, you mentioned him earlier, Mel. He had eight and a half inch hands. I saw that that was tied for the smallest hands of any offensive tackle or offensive lineman in like recorded combine history. Does that matter? And where is the stock at right now for Olu? Because I would have thought coming into the season there was a top five chance, and now it feels like maybe he's kind of going a little bit of the wrong way. Yeah, no question. I think the athleticism and, and the ability to develop in the NFL, but that's a concern to hand. To think about where we are in terms of the tackles, could he drop into that 20 range? I think it's a potential he could into that mid to later portion as opposed to the top 10. I thought it was a nifty nine field. Yeah. If you take Olu out, now it's an elite eight. Now we got an elite yes! eight, right? there we go. And yeah. Dallas Turner, we, we got an elite eight now, okay? We definitely have that. But Dallas Turner, based on the workout and the performance field, the outside line pass rusher at Alabama, now it's going to be really interesting to see where he goes because he's a guy, you talk about validation, you got it with Dallas Turner at that yeah. workout. 4-4-6 four, four, in the 40 for Dallas Turner, 40-and-a-half-inch vertical jump. If you have any questions athletically about Dallas Turner, they have all been answered, although I'm not sure anybody actually had any athletic question marks about him. All right, coming up here on First Draft, Mel and I are going to dive into some notable cornerback prospects when we return. All right, back here on First Draft, he's Mel Kuyper Jr. I am Field Yates. And Mel, so I've been talking about how at the wide receiver spot and at the offensive tackle spot, you might have a guy that you think is the best, but I think cornerbacks two through five, six, seven could be a classic case of it's what you want in a corner, what you need in a corner relative to your system. Let me start here. Do you think that Terry and Arnold running a 4-5-140 at the Combine did anything to dissuade you from feeling like he was cornerback one in this class? No, he didn't because of 4 5 one and being so smooth as he is. And I'll tell you what, he is a guy, he's got energy, boy. Does he yeah. love to talk the game? Great interview. Uh, Terry and Arnold, good player with versatility, gets his hands on a lot of balls. Uh, but Quinion Mitchell mm -hmm. has to be now, based on Senior Bowl, Combine, Toledo, over a couple of years, what he was able to do. You talk about being the pass breakup supreme corner. Quinion Mitchell field, he's nailed the process. He hasn't had any red flags. There's no blemishes. There's nothing. He has done it perfectly everything you would want him to do. And for me, Quinion Mitchell's got to be in that discussion to be maybe a top 12 pick in the first round. Cornerbacks with his ability over a two-year period and then to go to the senior bowl and the combine and test the way he did field, he could be slightly ahead of Terry and Arnold by the time we get to late April. 4-3-3-40 three, three, for Quinion Mitchell had 18 pass breakups this past season at Toledo. Had just one interception, but obviously got his hands on a lot of footballs. And of course, Mel remembers that two years ago, he had a game with four interceptions and two pick sixes. That's right. One game with four day. interceptions and just two, and excuse me, and two pick sixes for Quinion Mitchell all the way back in 2022. All right, we got a little bit of technical difficulties right now, so you're going to have to deal with me, and I'll rip through some of the things that I thought about this class. And I, I will get Mel's feedback if he jumps back here on the show in just a moment. But one of the things that I think so fast is so fascinating about the corners is that if we accept that Terran Arnold 
is one, with Quinion Mitchell maybe like nipping on his heels as cornerback two. Here's where things get fascinating for me, is that after those two, you can kind of take your pick between a variety of corners to be cornerback three through cornerback six. You've got, amongst others, Nate Wiggins, cornerback from Clemson, ran a 4 2 9 40. That was the fastest defensive player, and if not for Xavier Worthy, would have been the fastest player in the entire combine. He also had under 30 inch arms, and 173 pounds was Nate Wiggins' weight. Everybody who watches this show knows how much I love the competitive spirit of Nate Wiggins, the speed, which was validated over the weekend, but some teams may say, hey, 173 pounds? A year ago, Emmanuel Forbes, who went 16th overall in the draft of the Washington Commanders, we talked about his weight all the time. The conversation for Nate Wiggins now may focus a little bit more on that weight and whether it is a detriment to his value. How about Cooper DeGene? who couldn't even do anything over the weekend because he broke his leg back in mid-November. What kind of value does he have right now? He's a guy that I think if he had been at the Combine, on field at least, would have absolutely crushed it. And yet, it's hard to say where exactly he stacks up relative to these other guys because of the fact that he wasn't available for the All-Star Games or for the Combine as well. Meanwhile, Kamari Lasseter from the University of Georgia had just one interception, I believe during his entire career, but he gets his hands on footballs all the time. And if you go back to last season, one thing that stood out was that his confidence in man-to-man -man coverage is off the charts. The guy absolutely wants the challenge of facing off against whoever your very best player was and is the nearest defender last season. And this is tracked by True Media, but it definitely aligns with the tape as well. According to True Media's tracking data, last year as the nearest defender in primary coverage Opponents completed under 30% of their passes when throwing the football the way of Terry on Arnold. All right, then you get to Ennis Rakestraw Jr. And again, I'm not going in a specific order right now. I'm just listing six guys that I think could easily be in the first round. And you're going to have to decide, what are you looking for? Ennis Rakestraw Jr. from Missouri also ran a 4-5-1 during the combine. Not going to blow you away with the speed, but... That was not really the hallmark trait of his game during his time with Missouri that we were expecting to be a big portion of his portfolio. He was the toughest corner that I saw in film this past season. If you squinted, you didn't have to squint that hard, you could see shades of Devin Witherspoon, the fifth overall pick in the draft last year. Now, Rake Straw's not as athletic as Devin Witherspoon is, but this is a guy who has all the edge in the world you could ever want. The way that he impacted the running game as a corner legitimately stood out to me. And I get it. Most people want their corners to be the kind of guys that can hold up and cover a Tyreek Hill or Devontae Adams, Justin Jefferson. You name it. There's so many great wide receivers. CeeDee Lamb, we can go on and on and on. But Rakestraw has this toughness, this edge about him that is just such a tone-setting trait. How does that guy stack up? The big takeaway that I have is that there are all kinds of corners, depending on what kind of scheme your team wants, runs, and what kind of players your team wants, wants at that cornerback spot. A couple other standouts, and I'm going to use Mel's list, but candidly, I agreed with almost all of these. We mentioned Quinion Mitchell already. How about Max Melton, the cornerback from Rutgers? Also on the short list to be on my top 50 players is Max Milton. Ran a 4-3-9-40 at just under 6 feet tall, about 190 pounds. And if you go back to Max Melton, in his career, a couple of things really stood out. One, confidence in man coverage. If you're watching right now, the video version of this or the TV version of this, you are seeing Max Melton drive on the football, make a heck of a play in an interception against Iowa. His on-ball production and his ball skills remind you a little bit of a wide receiver. And why do I say that? <clears throat> Well, his older brother, Bo Melton, was mentioned by Mel earlier on in the show as he was a seventh-round pick of the Seahawks a few years back and now plays for the Green Bay Packers. Max Melton's confidence is contagious as well. This past season, Rutgers, who obviously was not going to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ohio State and Michigan from one to player 100 on the roster, Max Melton said, give me Marvin Harrison Jr. and look just fine against Marv. He said, give me Roman what Wilson. Happened? who ran a terrific time in Indianapolis, a 4-3-9 for Roman Wilson, the awesome receiver from Michigan. He looked just fine. So Max Melton is going to find a home and be very comfortable believing that he can be the number one cornerback in that offense the minute he takes the field. I've got him as the potential top 50 player. 
And we've got Mel Kuyper Jr. back. And Mel, you just had to listen to me talk there. I've already covered a little bit of ground here. We've got two corners left that we want to discuss. Let's talk about Mikey Sanders still from Michigan. And of course, the great state of Massachusetts. What'd you like from what you saw in Indianapolis? I'd say just like Quinian Mitchell, you talk about doing everything you want him to do, Field. Mikey Sainer still is that nickel slot corner who just makes plays. I've talked about Mike Hilton, what he did at Ole Miss in the NFL. This kid just shows up. He's a Jim Harbaugh favorite. You talk about former wide receiver, right? Think about the ability to tackle, the ability just to come off that edge and wreak some havoc in coverage to get the job done there. He just shows up big. He has that knack. Some have a knack, some don't have a knack. Is it the it factor? Is it instinctual ability? Is it seeing things others don't? Mikey Sainra still has that ability as a third, fourth rounder field to be a guy who's going to play in the NFL and impact the defense. He can do a lot. He tested well. He played well. He is a guy, like I said, at Michigan was one of the key guys on a talent-laden defense. A lot of those guys are going to be in the NFL. He was one of the key entities and one of the reasons why they won a national title. So from Max Melton at Rutgers, I think very underrated. Now, all of a sudden, he's not underrated anymore. Now, Max Melton's maybe a second-round pick, right? Mikey Sainer is still no. He's not going to get into day three the way it looks right now. Maybe early day three, but late day two in that area. And like I say, Quinion Mitchell from Toledo, I think now may be CB1. Right there with Terry and Arnold at worst CB2 field, but Quinion Mitchell, CB1 possibly. I didn't what, 17 to Jacksonville. Yeah. He may get bumped up maybe into that uh, top 12, 13 spot. Yeah, and Mel, it's important to remind people, like, if you have Quinion Mitchell at player 13 on your overall big board and Taron Arnold is player 11, like, what are you really telling us? You're telling us that basically these guys are the exact same. We have less than a minute here, Mel, but just as far as players who maybe saw their value dip over the weekend, Kalen King from Penn State running a 4-6-1 unfortunately continues what was a disappointing 2023 season for him. Yeah, you thought with Joey Porter Jr. opposite him, we liked a lot of things we saw of Kalen King in 2022. 2023, he's the guy, right? And you saw some struggles in coverage, and you saw the inconsistencies and the issues, and then the run in that 4-6 range kind of outdated, which you saw the struggles, because you don't have those numbers on the, on the players until they get to this point to validate what we saw. Is it really what we are? Is it going to get better? Can you improve on that once you're in the NFL when you're coached up? So I think Kalen King now you talk about dropping during the year running that 40 now I think pushes him in solidly into day three all right we're coming up here with more thoughts on the 2024 NFL combine we pay tribute to the great late Chris Mortensen next year on first draft all right we're back here on first draft and while the 2024 NFL combine was an event that we certainly enjoyed devastating news was brought to our attention yesterday Sunday and that was the passing of Chris Mortensen, Mel, and certainly somebody that has played a monumental role in both my and your careers. What are your thoughts on Chris Mortensen as a man? An unbelievable man, a one of a kind. And to Mickey and to Alex, uh, our condolences, heartfelt condolences. Kim and I it was, it were crushed yesterday, and Lauren and Alex, uh, and my son-in-law, all crushed uh, to hear this news. And and you know, Chris uh, battled. He fought. He never complained. When you talk to Chris, hey, anyone to talk about? It, let's talk football. But guess what? Well, 80% of our conversations were about family. I was like, how's Alex doing? How's Mickey? They'd ask, hey, how's Lauren? The messages, I still hope I have some of those messages he left. Like, Lauren, Kim, hope you're all doing great. Mel, tell your dad to call me. I got some things we need to talk about. You know, Warwick, I, I got some things I need to talk to him about. So, again, a, a great man, the, the incredible wit. Uh, and you know, he'd always, you know, there'd be a curveball he'd throw you during a conversation, and then we'd get back to it, we'd all laugh. You didn't leave a conversation with Mort without laughing and having fun, but like I say, 80% was family, 20% football. An incredible man, and one of the saddest days yesterday to hear that news. And like I say, to Mickey, to Alex, uh, I tell you, it's just, just you know, as a father, as a husband, he was everything you'd want. Uh, what a loss. And I tell you what, this is one of the saddest days I've had, never had to deal with. And uh, just a phenomenal, phenomenal man all the way around. Incredibly well said, Mel. And I know this, uh, Mort's watching right now, and he's incredibly bothered by the fact that we're talking about him. You know why? Because yes. while Mort was a very family-oriented man, he loved football. And he would say, you guys are wasting a block of your show talking about me when instead I want to hear more of your thoughts on the combine. But Mort, we're still going to do it. You know, Mort was a deeply spiritual man. And, uh, you know, I went back and reviewed some of those messages, Mel, because I was so grateful to have been the recipient 
of some of the messages that you are referencing. And I went back and I saw when, uh, when my wife and I had our first daughter back in 2022. And Mort sends a beautiful note to, uh, to me. And then a week later, unprompted, just said, you know, I've continued to pray for you and Chapin and Kinley every day as you get through this wonderful first week of life. And it just reminded me that Mort had a heart of gold. He was so deeply caring about everybody in this ESPN family. And while we here at ESPN talk about sports, we are a family more than anything else. Uh, Mort will miss you immensely. He absolutely loved the NFL draft. He was there every year bringing boots on the ground coverage, Mel. And as I said, Mort will be disappointed that we're talking about him right now. So maybe the best way that we can pay homage to Mort as we close the show here is to just put together any final thoughts on the Combine or what you look forward to over the next month and a half as we lead into the 2024 NFL Draft. I think, like you say, for a Mort, I'd be getting those calls. And, you know, you move this. We thought about moving guys up. I miss those calls saying, you know, get him up a little bit. Move this guy down. And, and Mort would be one to feel when there was something that he told me that didn't work. He'll be the first one as soon as the draft. No, I'm really sorry. I, I steered. I'm sorry for what? You know, out of 30 things he said, 29 were right. But Mort would always remember that one thing. That, that, so he was just so humble. So uh, just like I said, just a just a great, great man. And uh, like I said, uh, it's just it's so, so sad. So incredibly sad. We're going to miss the heck out of you, Mort. We're going to do our best to honor you in every way that we know how. One of those will be to hopefully continue to inform and educate people on the 2024 NFL Draft. And this show will be back on Thursday. We'll dive into my top 50 and anything else that might come up between now and then. Mort, we miss you. For the great Mel Kuyper Jr., I'm Field Yates. We'll talk to you guys on First Draft on Thursday.